Can somebody confirm you can hear me? I can hear you. Thank you, Desiree. All right, before I show my screen, let me state that I've done some grading. I want to call up the grade book and then I'll <clears throat> have an easier time to keep that one. Let me uh, close that down. Close that down. Uh, obviously, I graded the last lecture worksheet. Let's see what that was. I have not graded the extra credit three or four. I need to get that done. I did grade worksheet for lecture 4B. <clears throat> And I know I graded uh, lab one and lab two for the second time. So I've graded for the second time lab zero, lab one, and lab two. You know, I thought I did lab three, but it doesn't look like I did. Um, and then I graded lab five and most of lab six. There's about a third of the people I still need to grade lab six, but a large number of people, I mean, about two thirds of the students have lab six graded for the first time and lab five for the first time. So that means you will be able to turn in corrections for the second grading by this Saturday. I haven't Put, posted that yet, but I will do that as soon as I finish grading lab six. Let's see, I've only got three more students to grade lab six on, so it's more than two thirds of the student are graded. Any question about any of that? Yeah, you said lab two was graded, uh, regraded. Second time, yeah. Oh, that's weird. And you usually leave a little comments on them? Um, if you got something wrong, then I will tell you what the correct answer is the second time. Okay. However, if you didn't get anything wrong, I don't have anything, no comments in there. It's just a regrading. Okay. Can I shoot you an email about uh, lab two? Yeah. Okay. If Thank I didn't you. send you a comment, I mentioned that to somebody earlier on lab zero, zero, or lab one, that if I didn't put in a comment and you got something wrong, shoot me an email and I will correct that. Because usually when I'm regrading the second time, if you got something wrong, I will tell you what you got wrong and what the correct answer is. Okay? Okay, thank you. All right. All right, any questions about the grading? Nothing further, let me um, let me shut this down, get to the uh, class, get off the grade book. And let me state that when people are talking over the Zoom, unless I go and look up who's talking, uh, I can't tell who's talking. So don't expect me to know. <laughs> Uh, who is talking and, and all that. Because <clears throat> I wasn't looking at the Zoom site at the moment. I was looking at the grade book. And so I didn't see who was talking. So you need to send me an email if I ask you to send an email. All right, let me share my screen now. Boy, they keep changing this, where the buttons are. Close that down. So today is uh, May 7th, and we should be starting Chapter 5. I'm not sure. Yeah, we are there, I think. 
And uh, there will be a quiz this week on, well, it's due uh, Wednesday at uh, 11.59 p.m., covering the end of Chapter 3, Chapter 4, in Labs 5 and 6. Any questions about any of that? If not, let me go to the lesson. Yeah, we're obviously not there. Have I given you the first outline slide of Chapter 5? I'm going to assume I have not. All right, Chapter 5, Microbial Metabolism. This slide gives you the major goals and a rough outline. Know the terms. Which catabolism, anabolism, activation, energy, an enzyme active site, competitive inhibition, non-competitive or allosteric inhibition, what is a redox reactions, reaction, what are photoautotrophs, photoheterotrophs, chemoautotrophs, chemoheterotrophs, what is fermentation, and we will talk a lot about um, aerobic respiration, I don't have that up there, and then after that we'll talk a little bit about uh, cyclic and non-cyclic photosynthesis. Uh, two, understand what feedback inhibition is. And three, and oh, excuse me. Let me warn you, I usually sneeze twice, so <clears throat> there, might, there might be another sneeze coming. Understand what aerobic respiration is, <clears throat> it's steps and how it differs from anaerobic respiration. Any questions about what we're going to be covering? All right, <clears throat> let's move on. So when we're talking about microbial metabolism, we're gonna talk about metabolism, obviously, which happens in all living organisms. Metabolism is all of the chemical reactions occurring within an organism. And because we're talking about microbes, it can also be said all the chemical reactions within a cell. Any question about that? We can break metabolism into two components. <clears throat> Excuse me. Catabolism and an anabolism. Catabolism is the decomposition reactions where a larger molecule breaks down into smaller molecules. When that happens, energy is given off by the reaction, and that's because the larger molecules have more energy in them than the chemical bonds of the, of the molecule than the smaller molecules. So energy is given off. Anabolism is the biosynthesis reactions where the smaller molecules are put together to make the larger, more complex molecules. This is a biosynthesis reaction where a smaller molecule makes a <clears throat> larger molecule and it requires energy in, for, in order for that reaction to occur. Any questions about that? All right, let's talk about this in a little more detail. <clears throat> Catabolism is where a complex large molecule such as starch is broken down into simpler molecules such as glucose. <clears throat> Whenever you change energy from the complex molecules to the smaller molecules, meaning change energy from one form to another, energy is always lost in the system to generate heat. And we say energy is lost, but heat is just another form of energy. So the total amount of energy is the same. You add up the energy in the amount of heat given off and the energy in the simple molecules and possibly the energy released to make ATP. And then that will equal the energy in the uh, 
complex molecules. Any question about any of that? So the point is heat is just another form of energy. It's not terribly useful to cells because once heat is made, the cell can't use that energy for any purpose unless you're a warm-blooded animal. You might use that uh, heat to help warm the organism up. But as you know, like in the summertime, you can overheat too, in which case you have to spend energy to cool your body down. So um, anyways, uh, you will note that this slide is showing you that when a complex molecule is made into a simple molecule, some of that energy may be used to generate ATP. And how that happens is you have ADP and phosphate come together and they absorb that energy and they make ATP. However, animal cells are lousy at making ATP. And we only have two um, reaction processes to make ATP. And that is aerobic respiration and fermentation. The only two processes, there are actually more than one chemical step, um, but the only catabolic reactions that can make ATP. Green plants are a little more efficient. They can make ATP in a, a few more ways. I don't know how many ways, but as you know, in our cells and in plant cells too, we have many catabolic reactions, such as converting sucrose into glucose and fructose. When that happens in our cells or even a green plant cell, that catabolic reaction cannot be used to make ATP. So my point is, is that most catabolic reactions do not make ATP. The slide is an oversimplification. There's only a few in an animal cells, only two catabolic reactions or reaction processes that can generate ATP. And then all of the other catabolic reactions do not generate ATP. Any question about any of that? All right. Now, when a, a simple molecule such as glucose is put together in a biosynthesis reaction to make a complex molecule such as starch, uh, the glucose molecules have less energy in them and the starch has more. So we need energy into the system for that reaction to occur. Whenever the cell needs energy, it tends to get the energy it needs from ATP. So ATP will break down into ADP and phosphate, giving off energy. Some of that energy will be used to make the biosynthesis pathway, meaning have the two glucose come together or several glucose coming together to make uh, starch. Any questions about that? So an anabolic reaction always uses up ATP but a catabolic reaction in human cells and animal cells, there's only two processes that actually make ATP. Now, whenever we change energy from one form to another, such as simple molecules like glucose into another molecule like starch, you always have energy given off by the system, and that's heat. And that's just the second law of thermodynamics that whenever you convert energy from one form to another, some of that energy is always changed into heat, heat energy. Any question about any of that? So I guess you can say this reaction requires energy for it to go, but the reaction does give off energy as heat also. All right. Uh, if you took... Uh, Biology 160, you might not have heard of catabolic and anabolic reactions, but they are very similar to an exergonic reaction, that would be a catabolic reaction, and an endergonic reaction.
The difference is catabolism and anabolism are looking at the size of the molecule and exergonic and endogonic are looking at whether energy is given off by the reaction or energy is being taken in by the reaction. Any question about any of that? All right. When we're talking about metabolism, you should realize that some metabolic processes involve more than one chemical reaction where you have several chemical reactions put together. Let me blow this slide up. Where one molecule, molecule A, which is the starting substrate, can be converted by an enzyme one to molecule B, which this is, molecule B is the, not the end product, but the, um, well, it is the end product of this one reaction. But then molecule B is the starting substrate for the second reaction made by enzyme two, and molecule B is converted to molecule C, and then molecule C can be converted by enzyme three to molecule D, and molecule D can be converted by enzyme four into molecule E, and molecule E can be converted by enzyme five into molecule F. So molecule F is the last step in the metabolic pathway. So we call this the end product of the metabolic pathway. All of these molecules will be the end product of the given reaction, but then the starting substrate for the next reaction. Come on, Moss. And so these molecules are called intermediate products because yeah, that's the product of this chemical reaction, but it's a starting substrate for this chemical reaction. Metabolic pathways are determined by enzymes and enzymes are encoded by our genes. So all metabolic pathways are determined by our genes. Any question about any of that? All right, this is the metabolism we're going to discuss today, all of the metabolism within a cell, and these are all of the different chemical reactions. You will, of course, need to know every one of these chemical reactions. Any questions? Oh, that was a joke. I was expecting somebody said, you've got to be kidding. We won't discuss all of these chemical reactions, and you certainly don't need to know most of them. You do need to know what a chemical reaction is, though. Chemical reactions occur according to the collision theory, and that is chemical reactions occur when atoms, ions, or molecules collide with each other. They will form the product of the chemical reaction if the collision has enough energy in the molecules colliding to disrupt the electronic configurations of the atoms, ions, or molecules. The reaction rate is the frequency of collisions with enough energy to bring about a reaction. The reaction rate can be increased by increasing the abundance of enzymes. If you have more enzymes around, then the enzyme's more likely to um, combine with the starting substrate and then convert it to the product. So you increase the enzymes, you increase the chemical reaction. You can also increase the reaction rate by increasing the temperature. Temperature is just a measure of molecules or atoms or ions moving about and the more they move about, that's vibrate as well as moving from one place to another, the more they move about, the more energy they have, and then the higher the temperature. So all temperature is, is a measure of the energy in the starting particles. 
and you can lower the temperature, and then those molecules move about less frequently. And so if you raise the temperature, they will have higher energy, and the higher energy will increase the reaction rate, meaning that the higher energy, when two particles collide, they'll have enough energy, or they'll more likely have enough energy to um, disrupt the electronic configurations and then make the chemical reaction occur. Any question about any of that? All right. Uh, these are all the easy parts. It's a little more difficult thinking about pressure. But the reason why uh, pressure cooker works is partly because you increase the pressure. And you can think of it as putting more molecules into a limited space. And the more molecules have you have in a limited space, the more likely they're going to collide with each other. And so that will increase the reaction rate. Any question about any of that? All right. Enzymes reduce the activation energy of a chemical reaction. Here we're starting, let me blow the slide up, starting with uh, an initial reactant, AB linked together, a molecule AB, and this could be something like sucrose. It has higher energy than products A and B, and that could be glucose and fructose. And so the initial energy level of the reactant is higher than the products, this reaction is likely to occur because the products have less energy than the reactant. But if you know, if you take a cup of sucrose, that's table sugar if you don't know, uh, and then look at it, I don't know, a day later, almost all of it will be sucrose. There will not be much glucose and fructose. And an easier way to do it would be, let's say that's glucose and it can break into CO2 and water, and you look at glucose a day later, a cup of glucose, almost all of it is going to be glucose. Very little of it would be CO2 and water. But eventually, it may take a century or longer, all of that glucose will break down into CO2 and water. Okay? And that's simply because the glucose has higher energy than the CO2 and the water. What the trouble is, why this reaction proceeds so slowly, is, is that when the glucose bumps into another molecule like glucose, or maybe it's oxygen, I have to look that up, <clears throat> to break into CO2 and water, yeah, it's oxygen. Uh, most of the time, they're not going to have enough energy for the chemical reaction to occur. And what you need to do is have the molecules collide where the collision goes over an energy hump, the activation energy without an enzyme. And once the uh, colliding molecules reach this amount of energy, which is much higher than this amount or that amount, then the reaction can proceed and the glucose will be changed into CO2 and water. And that's the activation energy without an enzyme. Now, I can get that to happen. You just take a blowtorch to your glucose. It'll burn away and uh, convert all the glucose almost instantaneously, um, certainly within a second, into CO2 and water. Any question about any of that? And what's that amount of energy? the activation energy without an enzyme with uh, glucose converting into CO2 and water, it's around 1,000 degrees. I think it's 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but it might be 1,000 degrees Celsius. It's really, really hot. Any question about any of that? Now, we can lower that if we put in an enzyme. And glucose can convert into CO2 and water with an enzyme, and there is an activation energy, but it's less 
the activation energy with an enzyme, and then we can convert glucose into CO2 and water with a lower activation energy. And how much lower is this? Well, it's happening all the time in the room you're, you're in. And where is that happening? Where glucose is converting into CO2 and water? In the room you're in. Uh, I know you guys are very shy. Do you want me to ask you to type in an answer? I will end the show. And now I can see if somebody types in an answer. Where is that happening in the room you're in? Your body? Yeah, in your own cells. Glucose is being converted into CO2 and water. That's obviously not around 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit because that would char your cells. So how warm is that? It's 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. That's quite a bit lower, the activation energy with the enzyme, than the activation energy without the enzyme because that's around 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Any question about any of that? All right. Thank you for uh, providing the answer. Wasn't that bad, I hope. Uh, enzymes are biological catalysts. Catalysts are things or molecules or particles, because they could be an atom, uh, that speed up a chemical reaction. You don't need to know how much they speed up a chemical reaction, but it can be up to 10 to the 8th times 10 to the 10 times greater. Like when um, glucose is being converted to CO2 and water, that doesn't happen very often if we had a beaker of glucose. Because like I said, it would eventually happen, but it would take, oh gosh, at least a century. Because I know that you have a cup of glucose and you look at it a year later, most of it's glucose. You will see some uh, hardening of certain spots of the glucose, and that's because the water is being made. And so even a year later, almost all the glucose will be glucose. And that is because the enzyme can speed up that chemical reaction 10 to the 8th to 10 to the 10 times. And then enzymes are encoded by genes. Enzymes are specific for a single chemical reaction. That's not entirely true. Some of you who have worked with drugs know that we have drugs which can mimic the starting substrate and then interfere with that reaction. So if you want to stop that reaction from occurring in the body, you can give a drug which can um, combine with that enzyme instead. But... Other than a few cases like that, I used to know a, a, a drug that did that. I think the statins work that way, but I'm not positive, so don't quote me on that. But uh, for all other purposes and for almost everything we're talking about in this class, an enzyme is specific for changing one chemical molecule into a the products of that reaction. And if we had another similar chemical, you need another enzyme to convert that chemical to similar products. Like for example, converting glucose to CO2 and water, you need a different enzyme to do that. Then actually you have several enzymes, but but we'll just talk about it in simple terms. You need different enzymes than if you're converting fructose to CO2 and water. Any question about that? The specificity of an enzyme for its chemical reactant, meaning why it only binds to one chemical reactant and converts that chemical reactant to the product, is the 
three-dimensional shape of the enzyme. Each enzyme has a um, each enzyme acts on a specific substrate and only that one substrate because the enzyme binds specifically to that substrate and no other substrates. And then enzymes are not used up in the chemical reaction. And they're not altered in the chemical reaction either, meaning the enzyme at the start of the chemical reaction will be the same at the end of the chemical reaction. However, that's not to say that the enzyme isn't changed because the enzyme actually forms a substrate complex, meaning the enzyme and the substrate actually bind together in a complex. And that orients the substrates in a certain way to increase the probability of the chemical reaction occurring, meaning it puts stress on the chemical bonds of the reactant, making the reactant more likely to form the product. And that lowers the activation energy. Any question about any of that? All right, you do need to know that enzymes normally end in ASE or ACE. This is the naming convention of enzymes. There are some exceptions. Most of them are really old enzymes that were named before the convention came into effect, like the enzyme renin, an enzyme in our stomach that curdles milk. It's really important in babies to make the milk stay in the stomach longer, and then it gives the stomach more time to digest the milk. But all enzymes that I know about ever since the convention was started, the enzyme is given the name ACE. Some examples, oxyreductase, um, isomerase, ligase, we'll talk about ligase, catalase, we'll talk about catalase. Those are enzymes. An enzyme doesn't act alone, there are some enzymes that require either a coenzyme, that's a small biological molecule, or a cofactor, usually a uh, metal ion, like iron, zinc, magnesium, calcium. So some Enzymes require either a coenzyme or a cofactor for the enzyme to function. And what happens is the coenzyme will combine with the enzyme, and then that will make the site for the substrate to bind. Um, and this is an enzyme and a coenzyme getting together with the substrate. You don't need to know the name of an enzyme before it binds to the coenzyme and then the name of the enzyme after it binds to the coenzyme. You just need to know that some enzymes require a helper, either a coenzyme, which is a biological molecule, or a uh, cofactor, which is usually a metallic ion. And that's actually why we need, uh, well, mostly why we need magnesium and probably zinc. And that is these metal ions work as cofactors to certain enzymes. Any question about any of that? You do need to know two important coenzymes. The slide is showing you the important coenzymes. You do need, you do need to know NAD+, plus. that's nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. It has a positive one charge. It's a niacin derivative involved in catabolic reactions. And we're going to talk about NAD plus when we talk about aerobic respiration. And that's why you need to know it. An important coenzyme that functions at least in uh, aerobic respiration. It, it functions elsewhere too, but uh, that's its main function. And then FAD, 
flavine, adenine dinucleotide, a ribofen derivative. Riboflavin is a vitamin B, by the way. A fat also uh, plays a role in aerobic respiration, so we'll talk about it. That's why you need to know it. It's an important coenzyme. A NAD P plus uh, is an important coenzyme in plants, and that's why you don't need to know about that one, because we're really not going to talk about um, well, we're not going to talk about plants generally. I suppose we don't talk much about photosynthetic bacteria, which probably use NAP plus. And then there's flaving mononucleotide, which maybe I should talk about it because we do run into it in aerobic respiration, but I don't talk about it in aerobic respiration. And then coenzyme A, another important coenzyme, but you don't need to know about it. We will actually talk about this one, but <laughs> I don't require you to know that one. Any questions about any of that? Uh, this is one that happens in the Krebs cycle, or actually the... Uh, The step right before the uh, step right before the Krebs cycle. So uh, it's the step between the preparatory step. A step right before the Krebs cycle, uh, coenzyme A comes into play there. We'll talk about that when we talk about aerobic respiration. Any question about these important coenzymes? All right, the enzymes bind to the substrate and form an enzyme substrate complex as shown here. And right here, we're seeing the lock and key model where one enzyme fits a substrate much as a key fits a lock. And this enzyme will only bind to this one substrate because uh, it has the ability to bind to that substrate right here by its three-dimensional shape, and other enzymes will not have the correct shape to bind to that substrate. The enzyme substrate complex puts stresses on the molecules of the substrate. Come on, mouse. And that makes the bonds of the substrate more likely to become the bonds of the product and then the product is made, it falls out of the enzyme substrate complex or the enzyme. And then the enzyme is free once again to bind to more substrate. And this can happen thousands or hundreds of thousands or maybe even more times, meaning the enzyme is not used up by the chemical reaction. Any question about any of that? All right, so the lock and key model emphasizes that the enzyme specifically binds to one and only one substrate, and they form the enzyme substrate complex. However, the hand in the glove model shown here shows you that the substrate binds to the enzyme, which is the glove. And what do you notice about this picture? There are three things that you can notice about this picture. One is very simple, and that is, what's the size of the enzyme compared to the substrate? A lot bigger. Yeah, the enzyme's a lot bigger, and that's generally the case with enzymes. They're generally a large biological molecule composed of many different amino acids, and the substrate's going to be usually a small molecule like glucose, much smaller than the enzyme. Uh, the second thing that you can notice from this picture is that the enzyme changes its shape, much like a glove changes its shape to fit the hand. The enzyme changes its shape to fit the substrate. Any question about that? The third thing is really difficult to see 
And if you notice the substrate here is a little flatter in the enzyme substrate complex than it was before. And that is the substrate is actually changing its shape to form the enzyme substrate complex. And I like to say this is the shape shifter's hand changing its shape to mold to the glove while the glove is changing its shape to mold to the shape shifter's hand. Any question about any of that? And that comes straight out of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, for those of you who know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a shape shifter and how we could have the hand mold to fit the glove while the glove is molding to fit the hand. Any question about any of that? Oh, let me end that and go back. Okay. So those are two, actually three different models of looking at how an enzyme binds to a substrate. The locking of the key model, the hand in the glove model, and then the extension of that, the shapeshifter's hand in the glove model. And the shapeshifter's hand in the glove model is actually the best um, way to describe an enzyme binding to a substrate. Enzymes do not work alone. There are different factors that influence the activity of an enzyme. An enzyme has to be in the correct temperature, the correct pH, the correct salinity for it to work at its optimal level. Heavy metals and alcohol, if they're around, they can decrease the amount that the enzyme, the activity of the enzyme. UV radiation can also decrease the activity of the enzyme. All of these, if they are present, they can cause the enzyme to denature, causing the protein to denature, losing its shape, so that the enzyme initially, like if you aren't working at your optimal temperature, like let's say you have a bacteria and its optimal temperature is 37 degrees, and then you cool it down to 25 degrees, it can still work, but it's not going to work at its optimal rate. The protein of the enzyme is partially denatured. And then you can cool it further, like in the refrigerator temperature, and now the enzyme is totally denatured. It cannot function. It does not have the correct shape to bind to its substrate. Any question about any of that? Enzymes can also be affected or influenced in their enzyme activity by the substrate concentration. Generally speaking, if you increase the substrate concentration, you increase the enzyme's activity. There is a point, we'll talk about that later, that only occurs to a certain point and then there are various poisons like cyanide and fluoride that can affect the amount of the enzyme's activity. The more poisons you have around, the less the enzyme will act. And if you have a fair amount, like a lethal dose of the poison around, the enzyme will not function. And that's actually how cyanide and fluoride kill people. And that is they uh, stop some of our enzymes from working and then the body can't function, and the person dies. Any question about any of that? I don't mean to be morbid here. It's just that I'm talking about poisons here. Or any question about that? All right. The enzyme can also uh, uh, have a influence on its amount of activity by inhibition. There are two types of inhibition, competitive inhibition, and non-competitive inhibition, which is also called allosteric inhibition. They can inhibit the enzyme and then uh, prevent it from acting. If it's completely inhibited, the enzyme enzymatic reaction will not occur. 
And then lastly, we'll talk about feedback inhibition, where you can have inhibition, a special inhibition which is found in cells that helps regulate the contents of cells. And that's feedback inhibition. Any question about any of this? All right. So I mentioned that enzymes can have various factors influencing them. If the enzyme is at the incorrect temperature or the incorrect pH, the active functional enzyme will have this three-dimensional shape at its optimal temperature and pH. But if we go at a suboptimal temperature and pH, the enzyme will totally lose its shape and we call that a denatured protein or a denatured enzyme. And there's the shape of the enzyme now. Obviously, if the active site is right here, that site is no longer present, and then enzyme cannot function. And that will happen at uh, extreme temperatures and extreme pH, assuming that, I should say, extremely different temperature and extremely different pH than the optimal temperature and pH. The enzyme will become denatured. Any question about any of that? A classic case of uh, protein being denatured is when you take egg white out of the chicken egg and it's sort of translucent or transparent and it's a liquid and you put it in your pan and then you fry it or cook it, and the egg white will change its appearance. It'll actually start looking white, and it'll change from a liquid to a solid. What's happening is you put the protein in a sub-optimal temperature, then you heat it, and then you cause the egg white to denature, to make the cooked egg. And that's what people, most of us, like to eat although there are a few people who eat raw eggs, but I don't recommend it. For one thing, raw eggs could have salmonella in them, and if you cook it, you kill the salmonella. All right, so different factors influence the amount of activity the enzyme have. All enzymes have an optimal temperature where the enzyme has its highest activity level. And this enzyme has a highest activity at around 37 degrees Celsius. So where might we find this enzyme? The optimal activity is 37 degrees Celsius. Come on, people. Where body? We... Yeah, your body is going to be 37 degrees. So this could be an enzyme of the human body. And then when you go lower than that, like at the temperature your skin is around 30 degrees Celsius, the enzyme can still function, but it's not going to function as well as at its optimal rate. And then at extreme temperatures, like in the refrigerator or above 50 degrees Celsius, the enzyme will have no activity. And that's because the enzyme is totally denatured. Now for the human enzyme, although 55 degrees or 50 degrees probably would be a uh, temperature where the human enzyme would be totally denatured and would not function. However, most human enzymes, they're not going to work at 10 degrees or even close to 10 degrees because that's refrigeration temperature. And I don't know what the lower limit would be for most human enzymes, but I'm sure it's not 10 degrees because that's refrigeration temperature. And human cells cannot survive at 10 degrees Celsius. Well, I guess they could survive, but they won't be metabolically active. Uh, you'd have to have it in tissue culture. And I don't know how long they could survive at that temperature. Uh, same with pH. Here we have an enzyme where its optimal pH is around pH 5. Does anyone know where on humans we have a pH around 5? Anyone from A and P? It's not the stomach because the stomach 
will get down to around pH 1.5 or pH 2. The blood? No, the blood is uh, around pH 7.2 to pH 7.4. So actually slightly basic. And I don't know why it's basic, but it's close enough to pH 7. And we need our blood to be close to pH 7 because of homeostasis. So pH 5 would be where most cells in the body, the human body, could not survive. But these cells can survive. That's your skin. Our skin is uh, somewhat acidic, and that's actually to help prevent the uh, pathogens from growing on the skin. So pH 5 would be our human skin, and this enzyme looks like it's an enzyme from our human skin and its optimal pH is around five. And when you go at a different pH going lower, the amount of enzyme activity will decrease until you go to an extreme pH, pH zero, and the enzyme will be totally denatured, it cannot function. And then here you increase the pH and this one you get it to pH 10, the enzyme will be totally denatured, cannot function. Any question about any of that? All right. Uh, as I stated, if you increase the substrate concentration, the amount of enzyme activity tends to increase. So if the enzyme is very low and the substrate's very low, you increase the substrate concentration, you'll make it so the substrate's more likely to find the enzyme and you will increase the activity of the enzyme. And initially, the activity will increase very rapidly, but then it'll start to slow. And then after a certain point, you increase the substrate concentration further. You do not increase the amount of the enzyme activity. And that's because all of the enzyme here is already bound to substrate. So it doesn't matter if you increase the substrate concentration further all of the enzyme is already bound, you cannot speed up the chemical reaction any further by increasing the substrate concentration. Any question about any of that? All right. Let's move on to inhibition influencing the amount of enzyme activity. We can have a competitive inhibitor uh, shutting down the enzyme. A competitive inhibitor is one that binds to the active site, the same spot on the enzyme that the substrate binds to. And like I said, we do have some drugs that work this way. They act as a competitive inhibitor, preventing the substrate from binding to the actual site of the enzyme because the drug is binding to it. And so it's called competitive inhibitor because the inhibitor is competing for the substrate for the active site of the enzyme. Any question about any of that? I should say there are other uh, inhibitors in the body that can shut down an enzyme by competitive inhib inhibitor. Don't ask me for an example because I don't know one but off the top of my head, but th we do have these in our body. What we're more likely to have in our body is a non-competitive or allosteric inhibitor where another molecule actually binds to an enzyme, but the binding is at a site other than the active site. And when that molecule binds to the enzyme, it changes the three-dimensional folding pattern of the enzyme. So the enzyme takes on another shape, and the active site is another shape. And now the active site can no longer bind to its substrate. And that will shut down the enzyme. If I think really hard, I'll come up with an example of that. Uh, you 
you can have com in competitive uh, allosteric inhibition with uh, glucose, not glucose, gla not glactose, lactose, breaking down lactose. You can have a competitive inhibitor shut down the enzyme that breaks down lactose. Any question about any of that? So an allosteric site is any site on the enzyme that is not the active site. And a non-competitive inhibitor, also called an allosteric inhibitor, binds to the allosteric site. The enzyme not, the site not being the active site. Cells can have feedback inhibition where they have a metabolic pathway where a substrate is converted into intermediate A by enzyme 1. Intermediate A is made by enzyme 2 into intermediate B. Intermediate B is converted by enzyme 3 to the end product of the cell. In this case, the feedback inhibition is the end product itself can then bind to enzyme 1 and act as an allosteric inhibitor, shutting down enzyme 1. If enzyme 1 is shut down, it cannot function, and then the substrate will not be made into intermediate A. No intermediate A, there will be no intermediate B, and then we shut down the production of the end product. So the end product itself is shutting down enzyme one. And what happens is if there isn't enough end product in the cell, so let's say the cell is using it up and then there's not enough end product in the cell, the uh, free enzyme one will have no end product or very little end products to bind to. So enzyme one will function and that will uh, start turning on the the production of the end product again. And then you'll make more end product and it'll build up in the cell and it'll shut down enzyme one. And then let's say it gets used up. It'll start falling off of the enzyme one. It, it actually binds as an allosteric reaction. So every once in a while, the uh, end product will fall off of enzyme one. If there are lots of end product around, another end product or the same end product will bind to enzyme one to keep it shut down. But if there isn't a lot in, of end product around, then enzyme one is now free to act and it will restart the enzymatic pathway to make the end product. Feedback inhibition is often seen in cells like this because it's a very efficient way of regulating how much end product the cell makes meaning it wants this end product level to be within a certain range. And if ever it falls above that range, there will be enough end product to shut down enzyme one, and the cell will make no more end product. And then again, if there isn't enough end product in the cell, uh, if the end product falls off, and every once in a while it does, there won't be end product around to rebind to the enzyme, and then enzyme one will make more end product. So it's a unique way of regulating how much end product is made in the cell. And then it's very efficient too. Why we almost always see the end product bind to the first enzyme, because it's the most efficient. If the enzyme were to bind to the second enzyme, you would spend energy making intermediate A, and then you're not going to use the intermediate A because enzyme 2 is shut down. And so the cell likes being efficient, and it's more efficient to shut down the first enzyme by the end product binding to it. And that's why we see this type of feedback inhibition in cells all the time. Any question about any of that? Oops. All right, let's talk a little bit about ribozymes. We've talked about enzymes and even mentioned 
uh, protein enzymes, where we said enzymes are mostly proteins. And when they uh, denature, the three-dimensional shape of the protein changes and the protein unfolds, and then the enzyme can no longer function. Well, we do have some enzymes which are not proteins. Most enzymes are proteins, but not all of them are. There are some enzymes which are RNA molecules. And the RNA enzymes tend to cut and splice RNA, but they can cut and splice other molecules or perform other functions like an enzyme. And they function as an enzyme in that the RNA molecule has an active site that actually binds to the substrate. And then the uh, RNA enzyme is not used up or modified in the chemical reaction. So it can once again bind to its substrate and perform another chemical reactions. And that can happen thousands of times. We call RNA enzymes ribozymes. So that's the term. And all you really need to know is a ribozyme is an RNA enzyme. It's not seen that often in cells, but we do have them. And I will discuss one RNA enzyme, and it's actually in uh, protein translation. It's the RNA portion of the ribosome, which uh, links the uh, newly added let me think about that. No, it's actually it links the uh, the growing polypeptide chain of the growing protein. It links that molecule onto the newly added amino acid. And so that's one enzymatic reaction that's actually happening by uh, a ribozyme, an RNA enzyme. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But when we talk about uh, translation, protein translation. That's the only RNA enzyme that we'll ever talk about in this class. I could talk about, I suppose, RNA splicing, but I don't even talk about enzymes when I'm talking about RNA splicing. Any questions about that? So all the other enzymes we're going to talk about in this class are protein enzymes. And your book does not mention that uh, the uh, transferring of the growing polypeptide chain onto the newly added amino acid is uh, a uh, RNA enzyme. The book doesn't mention that. So I'm just mentioning it to you. It's the only RNA enzyme we'll talk about in this class. All right, if there's no questions, let's move on to another topic, metabolic diversity among organisms. All organisms, including microbes, have metabolic diversity, and they all require the following. They all require an energy source, and all living organisms require a carbon source. We can divide all organisms into where they get their energy source, and where they get their carbon source. So based on an organism's energy source, we can classify an organism as a phototroph if they derive their energy from light. If on the other hand, the organism derives its energy from a molecule, a compound, either an inorganic or an organic compound, we call these organisms a chemotroph. So I think everybody knows green plants are a phototroph. They get their energy from light. And then everybody knows that humans are a chemotroph because we derive our energy from an organic chemical compound, largely glucose, but essentially any molecule we eat and digest. 
Now, let me do state that uh, some microbes can get their energy from an inorganic chemical compound. And these are mainly the chemosynthetic bacteria. Any question about any of that? All right. We can also classify organisms based on where they get their carbon source from. An organism can be an autotroph, and they get their principal carbon source from CO2, either dissolved in the air or dissolved in water. Everybody knows green plants are autotrophs. They get their carbon from CO2 in the air. And then I think everybody knows humans are heterotrophs. A heterotroph is one who gets their principal carbon source from an organic chemical compound, such as glucose. And we get our carbon from the foods we eat, largely glucose or something that's converted into glucose. There are some exceptions, like among marathon runners. But most heterotrophs get their carbon from an organic chemical carbon source, largely glucose, or most importantly, glucose. I guess that's a better way to word it. Any question about any of that? All right, if ever you get confused on the metabolic diversity among organisms, just separate it down into where is the organism gets its energy source. If it gets it from light, it's a phototroph. If it gets it from a chemical, it's a chemotroph. And then you can split it into where is the organism get its carbon source. If it gets it from CO2, it's an autotroph. If it gets it from an organic chemical compound, such as glucose, it's a heterotroph. And the reason why I'm saying split it down is we can also classify organisms based on where they get both their energy source and their carbon source at the same time. A photoautotroph is one which gets its energy needs from light and its CO2 needs from um, carbon dioxide. And I think everybody knows a green plant is a photoautotroph. Why well, I talked about that first. I'm going to skip photoheterotroph and a chemoautotroph for now and come back to them because the second most easy to understand is the chemoheterotroph. And that's because humans are chemoheterotrophs. Chemoheterotrophs get their uh, um, energy needs from a chemical compound, such as glucose, why they are a chemotroph. Chemoheterotroph, chemotroph, they get their energy need from a chemical compound. And they get their uh, carbon dioxide from a uh, from an organic chemical compound. Any question about that, such as glucose? Now the chemoheterotrophs you probably have heard about, but just not very often. The chemosynthetic bacteria are an example of a chemoautotroph. They get their energy needs from a chemical, while well, they're a chemotroph, and they get their CO2 needs from uh, CO2 dissolved in the air or the water. And why some of the chemosynthetic bacteria are chemoautotrophs. Any question about that? And then there's lastly, the photoheterotrophs. They get their energy needs from light, but they get their carbon from an organic carbon source like glucose. And these are photoheterotrophs. These you probably never heard of. Let me go to my next slide. The photoheterotrophs. An example would be green and purple non-sulfur bacteria. How many people have ever heard of them? Probably not many. All right, when we're talking about the photoautotrophs, you should realize that uh, they get their energy needs from light, 
their CO2 from carbon dioxide. But we do have two examples of two types of photoautotrophs. There's the oxygenic, cyanobacteria and photosynthetic plants, or oxygenic photoautotrophs. And then there is anoxygenic. They do not generate oxygen. And the green and purple sulfur bacteria are examples of anoxygenic photoautotrophs. And no, you don't need to know examples of the anoxygenic photoautotrophs. I already gave you the example of the photoheterotrophs, the green and purple non-sulfur bacteria. I didn't give you an example of the chemoautotrophs. Actually, you're familiar with one chemoautotroph. How many of you have ever look, lifted up the toilet tank and looked inside the toilet tank? I'm not talking about the toilet bowl where you go to the bathroom. I'm talking about the reservoir water up above the tank. I mean, above the, the bowl, sorry, above the bowl. How many of you ever lifted that up and looked in there? If you've done that, have you ever seen anything like yellow scum or brownish scum attached to the toilet tank? Anybody? Yes. Yes, or yeah. No? yes. Yeah, that's actually a chemoautotrophic bacteria, a chemosynthetic bacteria that is getting its CO2 from, uh, it's getting its carbon, sorry, from CO2. Yeah, that's the only carbon source around. And most of it's the iron oxidizing bacteria, bacteria that are getting their energy needs from a chemical compound, such as the iron dissolved in the water. So that's what that orange or brownish scum is, a chemo autotroph or chemosynthetic bacteria. The chemoheterotrophs, a good example, are humans, where we get our energy source from a chemical such as glucose. And then we get our carbon source also from an organic compound such as glucose. And you'll note for the chemoheterotrophs, oftentimes they get both their energy source and their carbon source from the same molecule. And that includes humans and animals and many bacteria as well. An example of a bacteria, which is a chemoheterotroph, is E. coli. Getting its energy source from the chemicals and the media, either the protein or carbohydrates. And then they get their carbon source largely from glucose or some other carbohydrate in the media. Any question about that? Now, here's something that's complicated, and that is you should realize that some of the chemosynthetic bacteria are chemoautotrophs, and some of the chemosynthetic bacteria are chemoheterotrophs. Now, the chemoautotrophs, chemosynthetic bacteria, always get their CO2 from, excuse me, their carbon from CO2. But the chemoheterotrophs get their carbon source from an organic compound such as glucose. However, the chemoheterotrophs, which are chemosynthetic bacteria, do not get their energy source from glucose or an organic chemical molecule like the food we eat. They get their chemical source from an inorganic chemical. And that could be iron or nitrite or nitrate, phosphate, a whole bunch of other possibilities. And what they're doing is they're stripping the electron from that inorganic chemical compound. And when they do that, they use the energy from that inner, uh, inorganic chemical compound. And there are some chemosynthetic bacteria, which are chemoheterotrophs, getting their energy needs from a chemical inorganic compound, but they get their carbon source from an organic compound such as glucose. And these differ from the chemosynthetic bacteria 
which are chemoautotrophs, and they get their energy needs from a chemical compound, and they get their carbon from CO2. Any question about any of that? So that's one complication. There's a few others I'm going to be talking about. Uh, when we classify organisms, you must know the classification in red. So we start with all organisms. We can divide them into their energy source. If they get their energy needs from a chemical compound, they're a chemotroph. If they get their energy needs from light, they're a phototroph. We can then divide the chemotrophs by where they get their carbon source. If they get their carbon source from an organic chemical compound, they're a chemoheterotroph. If they get their carbon source from CO2, they're a chemoautotroph. And then we can divide the phototrophs where they get their carbon source. If they get their carbon from an organic chemical compound, they're a photoheterotroph. And yeah, you guys don't really know a photoheterotroph. And they Get, can divide the phototrophs by their carbon source. If they get their carbon in, from CO2, they're a photoautotroph. And everybody knows photoautotrophs are green plants, as well as um, most, but not all, photosynthetic bacteria. You do not need to know the portions of the classification outside the red bar, such as we can divide the photoautotrophs into oxygenic photosynthesis and then an oxygenic photosynthesis. So in oxygenic photosynthesis, the cells produce oxygen and in oxygenic photosynthesis, the cells do not produce oxygen. They usually produce sulfur. And then you can split the chemoheterotrophs into different groups, like where they get their final electron acceptor, where the electron coming from glucose finally goes. If it goes to oxygen, which is most all animals, most fungi, protozoa, and bacteria, many bacteria, then they are uh, anaerobic respiration chemoheterotroph. If on the other hand, the chemoheterotroph, uh, the electron does not end up at oxygen, it's some other molecule other than oxygen, they are uh, an anaerobic, undergo anaerobic respiration. And you can look at whether they use organic compounds, or inorganic compounds. And we're not going to talk about the examples of these. Any question about any of that? All right. I think we'll stop here and I'll continue with this next time. Any questions? If not, I'll see you in the lab. Um, do, when will the uh, slideshow be available for us to study? You're talking about this slide or the last one? I mean, the, the chapter five uh, slides. Uh, that, that will be available when we finish chapter five. All right. If there's no further questions. I'll see you in the lab at 630.